Chris Pern, you directed The Willoughbys, which is based on Lois Lowry's book. Uh, when did you first come across the book? Um, I met the producer, Luke Carroll, in uh, 2016. So uh, he gave me the book and I read it and then immediately sort of responded to the subversive kind of roll doll um, kind of, you know, humor that Lois had in those pages. And um, yeah, did a pitch back and, you know, five years later, it's coming out or four mm -hmm. years later. <laughs> <laughs> this, I, I understand this was like already in the works before you, you came on board. Um, it was optioned and um, Ricky Gervais was attached. So that was kind of the extent of what was um, kind of in, in play. There, there was some art that was, um, you know, generated at the studio. Uh, so yeah, but, but it was very much like a kind of an open, an open, uh, you know, opportunity to kind of come in and uh, and kind of challenge the material and 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 come back with our 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 take on it. Um, so yeah, it was it was it was it was really it was really fun. Mm -hmm. Were they looking for like a, a slightly different take? Um... Yeah, it's one. Of, it's like one of those things when you do a pitch back. I think it, it's important to you know kind of come in with that intent that is as you know as honest as 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 it can be. So like ultimately, I, I'm. I'm not sure what they were looking for, but I know when I read it, it immediately struck me as that kind of um, arrested development, dysfunctional family story. And yet there was an element of the kind of, I guess, wildness of those kids that that I could relate to in terms of being a father to my own children who were kind of raised in the you know animation wars. So they're kind of, you know, uh, citizens of the world and, and they've had very weird, lifestyle opportunities with you know homeschooling and bouncing around from country to country as we you know kind of chase work and i think that idea of these these kind of odd children finding their way in our modern world like that was basically what i pitched back it was kind of like a really like gray gardens meets the rest of development for kids and <laughs> and, and they, they they latched onto that and and so i think um i think from that point on it was it was really just the the journey of trying to you know take that tone and and ride the line between you know the subversive you know kind of making fun of what the film was suggesting you know that idea of like they wanted to be orphans the problem is they had parents like that was a really that's a funny comedy nut but then on the other side of it there is that emotional story of the family you're born into versus the family you choose which to me is a universal coming of age thing that we all kind of have different varying degrees of so i think i think that was just the the seed of the journey I'm now just picturing like Big Edie and Little Edie in the booths in this yeah. movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, to that point, you have like the cat, you know, Ricky Gervais as the narrator, and he kind of, you, you know, suggests uh, a lot of that subversiveness in his narration with like always saying, like, this is an old fashioned story, but it can't end like this. So, yeah. kind of like cluing you in. Uh, there are some dark themes in this movie, and but they're offset by a lot of the animations, like these bright, bold colors and the comedy, and even the music is pretty upbeat. So how do you find that balance in not just the storytelling, but the animation? Yeah, I mean, th there was a definitely like this emotional um, kind of undercurrent in the novel that I, I, I latched onto this idea of like, you know, there's a lot of movies about families where like kids are loved and they have challenges, but what happens if you're in a family, you're not an orphan and you're not loved. Like, and that's a real thing. And, and you know, we all have, um, you know, some degree of experience with that. So I think the idea of talking about it felt um, important. But at the end of the day, I didn't want to make the movie heavy. I wanted to have a way to talk about that, that sort of real subject matter without it being a drag and also like give it, you know, give it its sort of, place where the audience always felt that they had the permission to laugh to, to be entertained by the, the 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 characters in this story because ultimately it's an optimistic you know uh, ending like like you know i do think you know no matter where you come from you can always choose love and that was that was the other seed that was kind of there at the beginning so working with my production designer kyle mcqueen we always wanted to make sure that the film didn't feel like a documentary, uh, unlike Grey Gardens. We wanted to feel like, you know, this is a parable. This is a cat's tale. This is, this is um, you know, a fantastic kind of, again, that roll doll world where it's like, you know, there are giants and there are like, you know, um, uh, you know, candy people that, you know, have factories. Like, like there's that kind of joyful kind of um, chaos 
underpinning the story. So everything from like the the colors to the textures to um, uh, casting Mark Mothersbaugh for the for the for the score and you know um, Royal Tannenbaums is one of my favorite films and we actually worked with like the, like the same musicians that made that film. So to me, it's it, it's sort of lined up in that sort of permission to laugh, um, you know, tone uh, necessity to deliver our story. Mm -hmm. Uh, what was the animation technique? Because there's this incredible yeah. texture to like all of them, like uh, their hair is made mm -hmm. of yarn and, and their movements are also kind of stop motion-esque. Yeah, in a, in a weird way, like like I come from the old days where we used to draw on paper and it warmed my heart hearing Tom talk of, talking about, you know, taking a year off to go life drawing. <laughs> um, like it was kind of 2D principle. So what really what I wanted to, again, going back to this notion of always having permission to laugh. Like when I was a kid watching Benny Hill or watching Faulty Towers and like like that, the idea of like kind of uh, the Steve Martin kind of ability to kind of hold his, his like he's resisting the physical comedy until he falls down the stairs. Like, a, like that kind of like the illustration of repression coming through controlled movement um, was really something that we talked about very early. And so, in, in the end, like when you take 2D principles where you don't pose to pose animation and you're removing frames and you remove motion blur, very quickly you end up in, in a world that looks very stop motion. And the other thing is like, we always wanted to have this feeling that this was a handmade movie. So like you could go to Michael's and buy all the stuff to make this film. So part of that came from the notion of like, how do we get the thing on the screen? So how do we, how do we design our world? So like if hair gets wet, it doesn't look, bad because we didn't have a huge budget. It was an independent film. So all of these choices that were coming from like the comedic tone, the desire to kind of really embrace animation principles for the phrasing of what the characters meant and our design needs to sort of, you know, hit a look that all kind of, you know, kind of stewed together to make that final product, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Everyone's gonna go to Michael's or order stuff from like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the will of these. Yeah. Uh, well, one thing I, I loved about the animation of the characters is um, just like their their body shape and the body language because the kids are like super thin and it's a nod to them being neglected and not fed. Yeah. And Annie is, you know, big and heart shaped and warm and she's literally trying to feed them. And even Melanoff is like big and rectangular. Uh, so can you talk about designing uh, their body types? Yeah, I mean, one of the things um, in it, it was it was present in the book, but it was also more present in the world is is this notion that there were like in 2016, 2017, there were walls going up everywhere, you know, whether it's like, you know, Trump's wall or Brexit and like I didn't want to get political, but it sort of felt like there was there was this sort of feeling of like people insulating and and it made me think of like a family that was living in a museum and in my hometown of london ontario there's a museum called eldon house which is about a colonial family and so I actually that became this huge inspiration this idea of like what if you were living in a museum and who lives in museums mummies so the idea is that the, the family is kind of like mummified like it, it they, they're all a little anemic because you know they haven't been nourished by anything new for a long time and it's not that they're resisting the outside world it's just that they forgot that, that it was out there they've kind of li they're living in their own their own mythology so every character that comes into their world when the bubble is popped they all kind of represent something new so when the baby comes in it's new shape language and it's like a new kinetic energy and new colors and and nanny comes in with like new like just this new energy, this new sound. And even like the, the the mood ring of the house starts to change as these like collisions happen. So every character that the kids sort of ran into represented, I think the through line of the story of the family you're born into versus the family you choose. And so both Nanny and Melanoff are kind of in some ways orphans themselves, but they, they have the tools to bring love. And so I really wanted them to feel full and that fullness is what the kids needed kind of through their arc of the film and so like just being able to kind of graphically subliminally tell that story was something that craig kelman our character designer really grabbed onto i mean even like down to nanny having that kind of heart-shaped hair like like when she first walks into the house it is like love falling over top of the kids and they don't know how to respond to it because they've never really been loved before so like that like i really love that idea of like like the character represents their metaphor um mm -hmm. if that makes sense yeah right and like to that point, also like 
you know, they're when they actually go out into the world, like everything is big and new to them. Like they don't really know how to cross the street. I love that running gag. Of, yeah. <laughs> you know, run over. <laughs> a little nod to Harold and Maude, you know, every time she got in a car, it was just like, what? Not yeah. really. <laughs> um, so what did Lois think of the movie? Um, she seemed to really like it. I mean, she was supportive all the way through and, you know, we shared with her the script towards the end and then, um, you know, animation is kind of hard to watch for a long time, you know, until you get a lot of the film put together. So we showed her the film uh, about six months or maybe five months before our final cut. And um, I think her, the thing that warmed my heart is that she really loved the parents. She thought that they were, they were funny. <laughs> So, and I know like making great villains and like the fact that they were parents, like we, we were always writing that line of how much to sort of, um, you I, know, I like that they were really <laughs> redeemed, like, yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, well, yeah, in, yeah, in some sure. ways, like, they're kind of children themselves. Like I always yeah. like look at dysfunction as being, well, what were their parents like? And at some point you kind of feel like the, the cautionary tale of this movie is if these kids didn't get out of the house, like like their fate might be kind of locked in. you get locked in at a certain point and um uh yeah i just kind of think um yeah they're, they're almost like I, I was always using that kind of 80s metaphor for like you know those john hughes movies and stuff or like there's the girl next door and then there's the the one you're chasing at the beginning of the story so at the beginning of the story the kids were always chasing their parents they they wanted that love um and and there's that moment in act three which like is this how should i feel like you know Tim's making a really good argument for going back with these parents. Like, and I really wanted the audience, half the audience to be mad at us that we were gonna have that ending. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. yeah. No, <laughs> they get rebuffed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, well, Chris, it was great speaking with you. Thanks so much for your time. And we'll see you back here in a little bit. Great, thank you so much, Joyce. Thank you. Yeah.